Hello, everyone, and bonjour. Uh, welcome and bienvenue. Uh, my name is Mohamed Lashmi. I am the resident vice chancellor of Ryerson University. Uh, before we get started, I would like to uh, open today's event by acknowledging the land we are on. Toronto is in the dish with one spoon territory. The dish with one spoon is treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. I would like to uh, begin by thanking Minister Champagne and Minister Fedeli for taking the time to be with us this afternoon. Both ministers and their governments have helped support the innovative and forward-thinking work of our university. They have also been great leaders in navigating our country and our province through this global pandemic. Collaboration and collective ambition are values held dear by our university. I am pleased that today's conversation will highlight the power of partnership and what can be accomplished when we work together. On behalf of the Ryerson community, I want to thank you for your strong and accountable leadership throughout this pandemic. Minister uh, Champagne and Minister Fedeli, thank you once again for being with us. I look forward, I look forward to listening in on today's discussion. I will now hand things off to Martin Cohn to get the conversation started. Over to you, Martin. Thanks, Dr. Lashmi, and welcome to our 22nd Ryerson Democracy Forum, where we ask how to do democracy differently. Our guests today are two working politicians from two different parties and two different levels of government who are working together to make democracy work on every level for working people and for voters. Now, Traditionally, I would start with our so-called senior level of government in Ottawa, but I'm going to break with protocol today for two reasons. First, having covered both Ottawa and uh, Queen's Park, I think they are about equal in power. Uh, but secondly, and our guests might even agree with me, but secondly, uh, this is the second visit to the Ryerson Democracy Forum by the guest I'm about to introduce first, which means he has seniority today in, in my mind. Vic Fideli is Ontario's Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. He's a former finance minister and he also served as interim leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. And it was in that capacity that he helped us kick off the very first Ryerson Democracy Forum about four or five years ago before the last election where he was the interim leader and we had the then Liberal Premier and the other uh, opposition leaders uh, together with us in person in fact. Now, he has been the MPP for Nipissing since 2011, and he was previously mayor of North Bay. I believe that he served as a dollar a year man. He can tell us whether that's true or not, or whether there was any inflation on that title. So echoes of C.D. Howe. Uh, he was previously an entrepreneur who built a hugely successful advertising firm, uh, which is sometimes helpful for politics. Uh, before that, he studied uh, business at Nipissing University. Welcome, Minister. Martin, it's a great pleasure to be back uh, on this democracy forum. You're right. I remember number one was uh, was spectacular. So I'll say hello to everybody and thank you. There you are. Welcome back. Francois Philippe Champagne is Canada's Minister of Innovation, Science, and Industry. He previously held the foreign affairs and trade portfolios, international trade, and also infrastructure. So all of which are incredibly useful for trying to navigate his way in his current job. Now, he has been the NP for Saint-Maurice Champlain since 2015. He's a lawyer and business executive. He studied law at the University of Montreal, but also at Case Western Reserve University in Ohio. So that would also be extremely useful training for dealing with our American friends and understanding our biggest training partner. We're especially grateful to the minister for joining us today because he disclosed this week that he tested positive for COVID-19 He's stuck at home, but he is still very much on the job. So bienvenue à Ryerson, uh, Monsieur le Ministre. Well, thank you very much, Martin. And it's a pleasure to 
seniors should always go first. So I'm happy that you put Vic first, you know, because if you look at our air, we're probably about the same vintage. Uh, but but it's, it's good to be with you and to all the students. Like you said, if I did not test positive for COVID, uh, I would be somewhere with Vic probably doing an announcement today. Uh, but uh, it's good to be with all of you today. And thank you for having us and Dr. Lashmi for uh, your leadership and Ryerson uh, as an institution in our country. So back to you, Martin. Seems hard to keep you two apart. Now, um, also joining us today as a special co-host of our Democracy Forum is Abdullah Snowbar who many of you know as executive director of the Ryerson DMZ, which he explained to me stands for, or used to stand for the digital media zone, but it has moved on to even a broader mandate. Uh, it's an incubator on campus that provides coaching and capital for some of Canada's best startups. He's also CEO of DMZ Ventures, the for-profit investor arm, and a director of the Business Development Bank of Canada. So pay attention, Mr. Minister, on the federal side. He's also, his real claim to fame, though, is that he's a Ryerson graduate for his BCom and his MBA. So thanks for being here, Abdullah. Thank you so much, Martin, and I'm looking forward to this. Okay, some, some quick housekeeping. Uh, some of our return guests or audience will know. We'll be opening it up to the audience shortly for questions using the chat function. So don't forget to include your name if you wish. I can give you a shout out when I, when I read it out. And just a reminder that this is not a news conference or some kind of a scrum. It's a democracy forum, a little different this time in terms of what we're trying to cover. So I'm not here to harangue our guests. I'll try not to go too easy on them, but I'm here to, I'm here to hold them to account or at least to explain what they're, what they're doing. So I'm gonna kick it off with a question for the federal minister, just to go back to respecting protocol here, because my first question is actually strictly personal and medical. Uh, I, how are you coping with COVID? Uh, I understand that your symptoms are mild, but how are you feeling? Well, thank you, Martin. You're, you're very kind. I would say, uh, I'm, you know, the fact that I'm with you is, is that the, the symptoms are mild. You know, the worst in all that is I have to slow down for a few days. Uh, that, that's the most difficult part of this thing is to slow down at least to make sure that uh, full recovery happens. But um, thanks for that. I think that, you know, many of us have been um, face with COVID. And I just, uh, it's just a reminder, uh, honestly, I've been lucky. You said I've been foreign affairs minister. I, I went around the world yeah. for two years uh, without uh, contracting COVID, but it's just a reminder, I would say for all of us and the students with us, we just have to be careful because you never know when, when you can be exposed. Actually, uh, with everyone that I've met over the last two years and never had COVID, at least that I know of, um, this week was just a reminder that it's still very much with us still. And, and that yeah. we have to be careful because it does not discriminate by age or a location or region or whatever you do. Or, um, or, or, or political party, in fact. Or because, political uh, party or either it's federal or provincial, trust me. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but thank you for that. And, and uh, you were, in fact, you had a bit of a close call because you were together yet again with, with Vic Fideli on Monday and with Premier Doug Ford. Lots of photos showing lots of love going back and forth between you former antagonist. So let's hope that everyone stays safe. I bumped into Mr. Fideli yesterday and uh, without me even asking him the question, he assured me that he's taking a test every day. So I trust him, at least on this one narrow issue of, of personal safety. Okay, uh, the title of today's event is Across Party Lines, Innovating the New Economy. And the underlying theme is that these two politicians with us today come from competing parties and rival levels of government. You've over, yet you've managed to overcome those differences and even become partners as I think people will see today. Now, maybe it's in your personalities. Uh, I noticed this about a year or two ago, but now this positivity has become kind of infectious because the premier, as I mentioned, and prime minister Justin Trudeau and, and deputy prime minister Christia Freeland and now various ministers, Karina Gould saying nice things about Stephen Lecce. I mean, I could go on, but, and, and I will when I, when I write about this in a, in a few days, but everyone is saying nice things about each other. And that is a big difference from four years ago when both Trudeau and Ford never missed an opportunity to kick each other in the shin. So it's fair to say that you two might have led the way. Just tell us what happened, starting with Mr. Champagne. How did you do this and, and why did you do it and why is it catching on? Well, I would say, uh, Martin, simply that's what Canadians expect of their elected leaders. You know, they want us to get big things done. I've never met anyone in the street or a student asking me, you know, about jurisdiction, about political affiliation. Uh, we have to all be mature enough to say what's at stake. 
Uh, I mean, if you look at the big challenge of humanity facing us, whether it's COVID-19, whether it's climate change, uh, those are the type of challenge that requires all hands on deck. And I think with Vic, what we've been able to accomplish, I'm very proud, you know, we, we get along very well. We text each other all the time. And you know what, who benefits? Well, it's workers, it's families, it, it's, it's the economy of Ontario, because uh, the only way uh, to get things done is by working together. There's no competition between, uh, I keep saying it, even between provinces or the federal government and provinces. Uh, the competition is South. Uh, the competition is in Asia. The competition is in Europe. Uh, every day when we attract investment, uh, when we create opportunity, we're competing with our jurisdiction. So the fact that we work together, mm -hmm. and I would say maybe it's our personalities. I like Vic, you know, we get things done. Uh, we're very upfront with each other. And if that was infectious in a way that other uh, uh, like the way we do, um, I think this is a good model for democracy. And in a country like Canada, which is, you know, in a sense, we have a big landmass, but everyone knows pretty well each other. Uh, it's a good model for democracy at the time where uh, the world is looking for stability, predictability, and the rule of law, which is in high demand and short supply. To see a country like Canada and, and elected leaders to work together is a good thing. Okay, but fair enough. But now we're going to push back a little bit on that softball question and that very, very on-point response. Before I turn to Mr. Fideli and then hand it over to Abdullah, what you say is true. And I, if I have a bias, I, I like seeing levels of government cooperate, even opposition leaders cooperate. I kind of like the, fat, the pact uh, in, in between the NDP and the Liberals in, in, in Ottawa, but that's not always the case. I mean, I, I, I don't want it to be a spoil sport, but Alberta is often pushing back hard against the government. Quebec has its own interests, as you well know, that are almost uh, systemic, if to use an overused word, that, that there is almost always a clash in competing interests. So, so why, why does Ontario figure this out? Well, if you're asking me, I would say in my relationship with Vic, we leave these things aside. Um, I, I don't remember once having talked about politics with Vic. Uh, when I talk to Vic, it's about what projects can we attract? What is the next investment we can do? Uh, how can you contribute to the project? How I can contribute? Uh, very, being very upfront and very open about what we can do. And, and I think it's a model, to, to, to be honest, Martin. When, when you're talking about jobs, when you're talking about growth, when you're talking about the economy, I have the same relationship with, with ministers from different provinces. I talked to Jason Kenney. Uh, I talked to uh, Fitz, uh, Minister Fitzgibbon in Quebec. Uh, I think maybe there's a space when it's about the economy, when it's about jobs, when it's about growth that somehow maybe, I don't know, I'm putting it there for discussion. Maybe it's been insulated from other forces, but I've, you know, uh, obviously I'm in politics, but I've never been overly partisan. And I think particularly when you're talking about if you put people at the center of what you do, you tend to leave all these things aside. And I've talked to Premier Ford many, many times. I mean, yeah. Vic would attest, we, we get along, we get things okay. done and, and it's a reflection of, of what we can do and how we should do in my view politics in the 21st century. So there's a bit of a safe space maybe on the economy, but again, not always. I mean, I, I think other provinces, I suspect that, I mean, I've seen Jason Kinney, the way he operates privately versus publicly. And sometimes there's a little bit of difference, whereas the two of you at a, at a public level are more collegial. So Mr. Fideli, I'm gonna call you if I can by your first names, Vic. Uh, so. the two, as, as you said, uh, you text each other uh, several times a day, a bit of a tag team. Uh, it, Feel free to, 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 to follow up on what Minister Champagne, uh, Francois Philippe said, but, but tell us a little bit about whether you ever get second guessed by any of your own colleagues saying, what's with you and, and Champagne? Why are you, doing, why are you doing these deals with the devil? I'm going to listen to the response very carefully. <laughs> I can tell you flat out, uh, Martin, that uh, not one of my colleagues has ever been critical of that great relationship that we have. In fact, I think they've more or less uh, complimented it and, and uh, commented positively about it. The only people that maybe don't like it, uh, Francois, would be our staff because we get these things done <laughs> between us, right? We just leap over the staff and say, you go in here, let's do that, you know, uh, you know, did you hear that they're moving this part of the deal? Like we, we are right down to the granular level. I don't think, Francois, look, I, I, I've been in the legislature 11 years. It was two terms as mayor. I can tell you, I don't think there are any other groups other than you and I like this who are right down that would know the granular level of a deal. 
we have done $12 billion in the auto steel sector in 17 months. We did that together. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, those don't, don't happen by accident. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that Premier Ford, Francois, myself, we're lifelong entrepreneurs. We know how to get things mm -hmm. done. We've done deals all our lives. That's all we've ever done. Politics is uh, uh, new, newer. Uh, for me, it's uh, now been 20 years, but it's, you know, Francois, thank you for the compliment, by the way. I am 15 years older than you, by the way. <laughs> oh, wow. 15, I am. I was born in 56, buddy. <laughs> so then, now I learned something. You see, Martin, you, you, you made sure that we would learn something about each other that we don't know already. So, uh, so, he, so he's, he's really, really my he's senior your, now. He he's really, really is my senior. Were, now I realize. He really is a senior when level. He said okay. we were contemporaries. All I could think of was contemporaries. I think you were born in the 70s. I was born in the 50s, buddy. This is great. All right. I'm going to so, award that over you. That's, you, you anticipated one of my follow-ups. Bear with me for one more second, Abdullah, as I try to finish off Mr. Fideli's thought. I keep calling by their surnames. I, I'm not that respectful in private, as you know, but but publicly even. Uh, you mentioned the bureaucracies. That's really interesting because it's great for two politicians to maybe be in sync now and then. It's pretty hard for bureaucracies, let's be honest, to, to find that accommodation with each other. It's just a natural territorial uh, rivalry between bureaucracies. So just if you can, first, Mr. Fideli, Vic, tell us how you crunch that, not just the political staff, yeah. which people might expect, but yeah. the bureaucracies too, nonpartisan bureaucracies, but still yeah. ferociously loyal to their level of government. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that I would agree, Martin, from the political, I, I have like 15 or 18 political staff and they take my cue. They know whether when it comes to uh, Francois and his team, we're aligned period. There's no deviation from that. We are out to do deals, whether it's in the life sciences sector, and, uh, whether it's in the auto sector, no matter what it is, we are doing deals. We're treating this in a business-like way and that's it. So they take my lead on that. I I'll guarantee you. And I know Francois would be the same way. From the, the ministry staff, I would say, you know, there was a liberal government for 15 years. Many were hired under that. You know, we've been in there four years. I don't find them very political, Martin. Maybe I'm naive, but I can tell you, I would never have a clue how any of the ministers. And, and sorry, I, I meant more. I said I meant more parochial than political, in the sense of provincial mindset. Rather, you know, the, the you know, we know more how to do this than the federal guys. They're at thirty thousand oh, no. feet. We're at ground level. No, I got to be honest. I, I, my chief uh, and my deputy uh, talks to uh, Francois's chief and Francois's deputy. They all talk together at a very uh, high level. I know we were doing one particular auto deal recently where we had our deputies, us, and the auto company all yeah. in the same room. We were able to do the deal, uh, as it were, that, that evening. Uh, I'll be very frank, Martin. I, I think the ministry staff maybe in the early days we we're waiting to feel it out and see how we were but no no they take yeah. our cues from francois and i this is this is this is business 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 i okay. would agree yeah. martin if i may say the tone comes from the top um you know when we arrive i would say vic and i maybe change the nature but i would say uh whether it's our deputy minister or chief of staff and and you know when they see what's happening on the ground, they realize. And 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 Vic was right. We're very much down to the details, so we know upside down these deals. Uh, and therefore, I think it 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 translates within the civil service the level of trust. Uh, when I started, for example, I think I realized that you know due diligence was done both at the federal and provincial level uh, sequentially. And I said, that doesn't seem to make much sense. You know, we're losing time, right. big decisions are being made. Now we need to move. And then with Vic, they said, well, well, would we share? I said, definitely. And I said, let me call Vic. And this was solved within like 30 seconds. Interesting. And these okay. type of things are really sending a signal throughout the civil service. And, and I can assure you, sometimes we have meetings together. I'm not sure if I organize it or Vic organize it. That tells you the level of trust and confidence we have. We just show up and we do what we have to do. Okay. It may also, one of the secret sauces might also be uh, tangentially that, that Mr. Fideli's deputy for a long time was Giles Gerson until he recently retired, a former federal uh, bureaucrat and, and former uh, liberal political staffer and former Toronto Star uh, editor. 
Uh, okay, Abdullah, thank you for your patience as we got these two going. Over to you, Abdullah. Well, first of all, uh, Martin, thank you so much for having me. And uh, ministers, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I got to say, hearing about your relationship is, is quite neat because it, it, in, in many respects, it actually removes a lot of red tape. To your point, Minister Champagne, you just kind of mentioned that, you know, this is how you really move forward and kind of build uh, for, uh, for, for growth, right? And you kind of, you're able to do things better and faster. And that's what we need to do to remain competitive. Uh, on my end, um, uh, I do have a lot of questions I wanna ask with whether it's regarding IP uh, or even adopting technologies within our governments to be able to be better. Uh, but I do wanna start off in the spirit of the word that Martin used, tag team. I wanna ask a question for both of you, if I may. Uh, and it's related to probably the, most, the single most important topic in the innovation space today. Something that myself and my peers across the country all face something that all of our startups in, uh, in our incubators and accelerator programs are all talking about, and that is talent. Um, and that's really, you know, something that we know, uh, you know, that's creating and thriving businesses that contribute to employment and our overall economy begins with the one thing, and that one thing really is quality talent. So beyond attracting tech giants to set up shop in Canada, to set up shop in Ontario, what is it that government is doing or can do to attract tech talent and make Canada or Ontario the ultimate destination for tech people to want to live, work, and stay? Um, and that, that's something that we're obviously having a, a bigger struggle with, but I'd love to hear from both of you on this question, and I will have a follow-up to it as well. And maybe uh, in the spirit of, 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 of seniority on age, maybe Minister uh, Fideli, maybe we start with you on this one, and then we go, we shift back to Minister Champagne. Thank you, Abdullah. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna live that that confession of mine <laughs> down, Martin. I can tell right away. Uh, first of all, you know, I think to the time we were luring two big tech companies from India, and Toronto Global was a big partner, Fed's big partner. We sat in India uh, at HCL and at Infosys. We sat in their offices. We talked to them about the fact they wanted to both come here. And they ended up both coming here, by the way. Uh, we did the uh, both of those announcements, um, if I'm not mistaken, throughout the middle of COVID. I think we did them um, uh, virtually through, throughout COVID. We sat with their executives and talked about the talent pool we have here. I think we're at 375,000 people. We're the number two tech cluster in all of North America, just behind uh, uh, Silicon Valley. Um, and we talked about the, 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 the training that we're providing to the students is the, um, is exactly the training that they need. So we are visiting with the tech companies, finding out what do you need? What exactly do they need to be taught? And they're part of the programs, whether it's in the college system or whether it's in the university system the instruction that they're getting and, and, and the, the knowledge that they're learning is absolutely immediately put to use uh, at the job. So Canada or College here in North Bay, where they have uh, a, a phenomenal program um, uh, that's based on exactly th three different companies in North Bay. They have students embedded in those companies. So they, when they do graduate, they're, they're ready to go. And I know the same is happening at U of T and other universities. Look at what the, 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 the deal we just did with McMaster. Uh, Omnia Bio, $580 million investment, 40 million loan from our brand new investment agency. Why? Because they have the talent there. This is a mesh between uh, McMaster University, the, the whole tech hub, the whole life sciences and innovation. I know I've talked about more. No, it's a, it's a great but, point. That, but, yeah, but hands on, that's the key. I think that's been the secret sauce. And that's such a good point, Minister, because I, I think this is the momentum that we're kind of, we're getting to, right? You mentioned it, we're, we become the most attractive tech hub in the, in the world, actually. And the New York Times just wrote about us as well as saying, like all eyes on Toronto and Canada, like what's happening there, you cannot ignore this. And it's a really important, and even kind of, you know, being, I got, this is not really a plug, but just, you know, something that I see every day, being at Ryerson and seeing what's happening there, and credit goes back to our president, you know, being able to apply innovation into the classroom. And what I mean by that is how do you really incorporate real life problems today and get students to solve for those problems and start building for those problems. And eventually I hope they become entrepreneurs in their own right. And they become 
creators of jobs as opposed to consumers of jobs. And that's really a, a, such an incredible outcome for everybody at the end of it. But um, Minister Champagne, maybe we'll go over to you just on, on that question as well. Well, Abdullah, first, let me say publicly, to be ranked the first incubator in the world, <laughs> I have to tip my hat to you, sir. Uh, when I think about talent, you don't need to look very far. I just have to look at my screen and I see it live. <laughs> Uh, because to be honest, to be ranked number one incubator in the world, I mean, let's be honest, that's no small feast. And it just reminds me of the first time I met with uh, the Secretary of Commerce in the United States, uh, Secretary Raimondo. Uh, in our very first conversation, she said, Minister, you really have a head start when it comes to AI, artificial intelligence. And, and I was really um, pleasantly surprised because it's not very often that down south, they would recognize us North as being ahead on something so openly. And in, it, to me, you, you said it, talent is everything. You know, to build a factory, you can go anywhere, but the talent is really key. The second thing I would say is the ecosystem. The ecosystem we've been able to build because uh, what we were able to attract, if you look at uh, recently, for example, in the biomanufacturing sector, when we brought uh, Sanofi uh, in Toronto, uh, what we have been able to do now in the EV vehicle and the battery ecosystem, I often say it's proximity to market, proximity to resources, proximity to the assembly plant. So talent com you know, combined with ecosystem is making a huge difference. And I would add to that, that in the, for us to be successful in the economy of the 21st century, I often see that like a pyramid where we've been investing in, in biomanufacturing, the automotive sector, in aerospace. We're gonna look at you know, uh, the um, hydrogen uh, economy, uh, the four uh, you know, tech, the biotech, acted, fintech, and clean tech. But what is gonna be underpinning our success is AI, quantum, and cyber, because those are gonna be transversal. And the fact that we are recognized, you mentioned the New York Times, I have the example of the Secretary of Commerce uh, saying that and what Vic said. That for me, we have laid the foundation, thanks to people like you, thanks to people like Ryerson, is that by the fact, and I know Ryerson is very strong on cybersecurity, if we are strong on AI, quantum, and cyber, all the other blocks that are gonna be on the basis of that will be successful because those are gonna be transversal. So that's why I think that what we've been doing uh, with the Ontario government, uh, the national, the Pan AI uh, Canadian strategy, what we're doing in quantum is the same thing. That is laying the foundation for the economy of the 21st century. The economy and people like you and the students with us are going to be our job, I often say, is to not only to preserve the job of today, but to make sure we have the ecosystem for the jobs of tomorrow. Vic and I, when we talk to people, I'm always asking entrepreneurs or CEOs, tell me, where's your industry 20 years from now, 30 years from now? We're not asking them, do you need money for 100 square foot, you know, 100,000 square foot on a factory? We would never have got a battery factory with that. What we said to them is, where do you see the market 20 years from now? And obviously, if you look on the automotive, obviously it's true, you know, uh, electric vehicle, that's how we got the bright drop. You may have seen all the commercial delivery vehicle in North America of GM are going to be built in, in Ingersoll. That's a big win. Mm -hmm. It's a win Absolutely. for 20, 30 years. In, and that's why I think what we've done is laying out the foundation for success for, for generations to come. No, really exciting, Minister. And, and I got to agree with you. You know, we, DMZ operates in more than 10 different places around the world, actually. And uh, whenever we ask our partners, why, why DMZ? Uh, uh, it comes back to the, to, the, to, the, to the fundamental that Canada is great. Canada is doing it better than other people. And you think about two things here. It's about the quality that we deliver in terms of the work that we actually do. It's, it's, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a rubber stamp of quality on everything that we're talking about and how we actually build innovation. And it's the people that are doing it. So it comes back to talent because that's really the core of, of, of why we're able to get ahead and get so far along with the work that we're actually getting to. So it is exciting. It's obviously, again, the time, the time is now, if it was ever a time, it is definitely now. Um, and it's really about making sure that we leverage this momentum and that we're able to actually do all these things and positioning us as being a, a being on the global stage, not being observing from a global stage, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to be on it and uh, showing up and showing out and, and doing our best to do so. So Martin, maybe if I can pass it back to you. Let me, let me uh, thanks Abdul, a great question and, and thoughtful answers. But now let me just rain a little bit on the parade because, because all of you have raised 
you're doing all you're raising all the right points uh, and more or less i mean they're trying to to orient and reorient but let's bring politics back into this equation i, I mean I, my background is in economics but political economy is what it's all about and um again that's where democracy uh ties in and let's 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 talk about why so francois philippe your cv as we said talk includes uh foreign affairs and international trade which makes you an expert uh, for better or for worse and gives you the experience in dealing with our american friends going back to your university days so you have had to deal with the american mentality on buy america fortress america subsidize america tell us how you can succeed or others have failed starting with Brian Mulroney and ever since, to, to get certainty and stability and predictability in that relationship. You can have all the fundamentals in place. We can have the Medicare advantage and the, and, and the skills advantage. But if they, if they put down barriers or if we put down, if we blockade our own bridges, and we'll come to Mr. Fideli in a, for, in a moment on that one. Uh, so so uh, the risk, of course, is that for all these amazing investments that you are putting through and subsidizing, uh there is now a chill on future investments so tell us how you are going to save the day starting with uh, francois philippe well that that uh, there's a lot in that market but you're right you know having been foreign affairs minister and trade minister and i spent 20 years of my life in europe before entering politics um you know what i say to my american friends and i've dealt with them in business for for, for decades is for me the big prize is how can we innovate more together how can we build more together and how can we sell more together to the rest of the world? Uh, I often said when we started, I said, Let, let's use buy North America. And the reason why, it's not just because it's nice. And I know you're a columnist, you would say, Minister, that sounds great. But what you're seeing in the world, first of all, two things. I see global supply chain becoming more regional and more emphasis on resiliency than efficiency. And we've seen it because despite all the investments that the OCD country or the West has done in vaccines, we found ourselves wanting when it came to vaccines at the beginning. That's how we needed to rebuild our infrastructure. They had left our shore for 20, 30 years. And now, thanks to the investment we've done, uh, we're going to be able to produce whatever may come next. We didn't choose that pandemic. We're not going to choose whether there's a next one, but we chose to be prepared. We're going to have the capacity to produce like 600 million doses in fill and finish in Canada. That's a huge step forward. But, but, let me, but let me but let me get you to circle back to the politics and, and i mean just as an aside just to poke you i mean here we created this vaccine and the who is saying no thank you tobacco but but let's talk about our american friends how do you deal with that psychology of the politics behind it tough politics well i i think it's um, what and and about medicago by the way uh, you know we're going to find a solution i i think it's smart for canada to have invested in the in the different uh, families of vaccines, plant-based uh, vaccines are you know may very much be in need next time. So I would not discount the investment. We'll fix the the shareholding. I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have poked you, but no, no, the but you poked me as a good a good journalist. But that's okay. I'll move on to the next one. I, I think what you're seeing also is you know when I was foreign affairs minister at the very beginning of the tsunami of what COVID became to be, uh, we were having the concept of trusted partners you know, trying to rethink the supply chain of the world. And what you're seeing now is really kind of three economic blocks starting to be formed. One in Asia around China, certainly one in North America and one in Europe. And obviously there's more commonality of values and, and objectives with Europe and North America. And, and therefore I think what you've seen, the OEM is a good example, is a realignment. Two years ago, the OEM were the, the, the car manufacturers to talk in, in, in more simple terms, the, the car manufacturer, they were quite happy to take batteries coming from China. Uh, now the reality is that they say yeah. these, these batteries have to be made in North America. So you're seeing a displacement of supply chain. And, and, and I think when I talk to the Americans, think about critical minerals. I often say to them, and I'll give you another story because these, these backroom story are always interesting. So when I met the Secretary of Commerce, I said, Madam Secretary, uh, we both want critical minerals. We both want to invest. And Vic is smiling because he knows it. I've, I've told him that story. And I said, by the way, uh, Madam Secretary, you know that cobalt, nickel, uh, lithium, phosphate, all of that is in Canada. I said, by the way, do you know that there's only one refinery of cobalt in North America? And she kind of looked at me and her official said, what do you mean? I said, do you know where it is? And she said, no, but I'm sure you're going to tell me. I said, it happens to be in Cobalt, Ontario. And so if we want to do things together, there's only one. And it took about 10 years to permit. So my mission 
is always to bring back to the commonality of purpose. If we want okay. to succeed in the economy of the 21st century, we have to work together. We're blessed by geography. We've been blessed by um, you know, the people we have, the talent, the integration. There's no two nations which are more integrated economically. And that should be, uh, should be the basis for our mutual success on both sides of the border. Okay, but uh, the Americans will cherry pick. They'll tell you know they, they they understand comparative advantage, but they also understand uh, they also are, are are vulnerable to beggar thy neighbor. And and so uh, let's throw this at at, at Vic. Uh, you were just in Washington with Premier Doug Ford, so you were you were having to deal directly with the the the, the politics of it. I can't stress enough; it's political. I mean, we can talk as much as we want about doing the right thing. But these are politicians who have endured four years of Trump trying to to remake the Republican view on free trade. And it's all about what's you know, what's good for America, America first. Democrats have a history of protectionism. We may like Obama and Biden, but they're more protectionist traditionally. So you have this this back to back protectionist impulse. Um, and to make matters worse, you had a bit of explaining to, and apologizing to do about our own bridge blockade at the Detroit Bridge, which was really awkward, right? And everyone gets that in terms of, of shooting ourselves in the foot. Uh, so, so tell us how you were able, what, what you heard and what you were able to get them to buy into. So it's really interesting when you talk about the blockade issue. And Francois, I, I will start the story, but I won't tell many details. There, were, there was Francois and I one evening negotiating with somebody on the very night of the whole Windsor Bridge. I gotta be honest with you, this is, uh, uh, you know, people in the US understand it to be like a one in 200 year event. The okay. So it, it really was, we understand uh, and we moved on and we did our deal. Um, when Premier Ford and I went to Washington, uh, in our back pocket, of course, was the legislation that was being rolled out that very morning by the Solicitor General, Sylvia Jones, that we have now put a very narrow piece of legislation that protects essential transportation routes. So protests, you know, fill your boots, uh, parks, and every, all of that is fine in Ontario and right across the country. That's what a democracy is. But our essential, tra our essential transportation routes now are protected. Uh, we'll be purchasing our own provincial fleet of tow trucks. So in, in about 15 seconds, we were able to uh, say, hey, by the way, uh, on that bridge, here's what we're doing. It's being done this morning. Let's move on. And, and to Francois's point, I can tell you, no matter what we talked about, at, we were at Commerce, we were uh, uh, at uh, uh, many different um, uh, business uh, min um, uh, divisions in the US that day, we packed about seven meetings in, you know, you could ask them about their dog or about the weather, all they wanted to talk about in 10 seconds was critical minerals, because they too realized what Francois said. Um, uh, only two weeks ago, uh, two weeks before we were in Washington, President Biden came out with their critical mineral strategy. But the only problem is they don't have any critical minerals. They're <laughs> ours. So it's a pretty sobering moment, I think, for the U.S. You know, I serve as Ontario's trade minister. And so we're keenly aware and we continually remind uh, all of the U.S. media or the U.S. Uh, the trade departments or the commerce departments, all of the people we meet, 9 million Americans wake up every single morning just to ship products to Canada. Uh, I'll use Ohio as an example. 300,000 men and women wake up every day in Ohio, in Ohio to make something to ship over to Canada. So this blockade or other things, are there constant reminders that we are absolutely and inextricably linked? You know, Francois and I talk about this all the time in our speeches. You know, a part is made here to go to the States, to add to a bigger component, to ship back here, to add to a bigger widget, to ship back yeah. there, to, you know, put an engine in a, in a tractor in Ohio, which is then sold to somebody in Saskatchewan who plants uh, oats. Those oats are grown, shipped back to the States. Cereal is made, shipped back to Canada. I mean, we are unbelievably linked. Um, one thing I will say, though, is, uh, is during the beginning of the pandemic, when we did see that you don't get my products, we're not sending you masks, we're not sending you, 
Premier Ford came out that very day and said, never again in Ontario will we yeah. be, be beholden to anybody. And so we put 50 million, then 100 million into the Ontario Together Fund. We went from purchasing almost zero Ontario made products because they weren't. Francois was correct. They, you know, ah, we'll ship our this or that product. We'll ship them offshore and have them made. We're going to make something else in Ontario or Canada. We went from almost 0% made in, made in Canada. Today, this morning, we're at 74% of all the uh, PPE that we buy is domestically produced, almost all of it made in Ontario. And in 18 months, we will be at 92%. That's where we I guess, are. I guess, I guess your around. point. I guess your point is, is that it's not just the connectivity, but we're having to reconfigure what does globalization mean? It's not just, it's no longer pure comparative advantage or pure free trade. It's about a security of supply, because as you say, in terms of PPE, if I can be uh, acronym like uh, you guys for a second, uh, you know, clearly there is a protectionist impulse here too, or, or supply, a security of supply impulse, because it's critical. Uh, Mr. Or, or Vic, you, you can't keep talking about Ohio because that's uh, that's uh, the territory of, of, of Francois Philippe. You're treading on his territory there. Um, but I, all I wanted to say, though, in terms of the, those questions, is just a reminder to everyone in terms of the frame of this democracy forum that the politics really are are complicated and 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 that the American politicians, just like Doug Ford at the outset of COVID, have their own political impulses because they have to get elected democratically. Democracy uh, is messy. On that note, I'm going to throw it back to Abdullah, and then we're going to go to some questions from the audience. All right. Thank you very much, Martin. I, I do have two different questions for the ministers as well this time. So, Minister Champagne, we'll start with you. And just to kind of use some of the words that you kind of mentioned earlier today, um, regarding technology in Canada has been maturing exponentially. And I think we can all agree on that. And introducing policy and regulation to provide market market certainty while you know reducing regulatory burdens and red tape for innovate, innovative startups and businesses is key to ensuring Canada's spot on the global innovation stage. So how do you think Canada is gonna be incentivizing the adoption of innovative products, uh, processes and services and, and more so, how do we, as as the, as the as 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 the government, as Canada, push the procurement of Canadian goods, specifically startup Canadian goods, from the startup, you know, people that we're trying to kind of elevate and bring back, bring to the global stage. Well, and that's a very good question, and and um, I'm gonna, you know, continue what Vic was saying. Uh, one thing that I've been trying to do is to look at. What are the critical elements for our uh, prosperity over the next 20, 30 years? You know, what are the type of things we need to onshore? Uh, what is smart procurement in the 21st century in the time of COVID or even the war uh, that um, Russia is waging on Ukraine? Uh, the world is changing very rapidly. These supply chains are moving very rapidly. I'm thinking about redundancy. I'm thinking about trusted partners. Uh, when I became industry minister, my first mission was to onshore uh, what Vic was saying, you know, uh, personal protective equipment, uh, fill and finish capacity. Uh, Martin was uh, poking me on, on Medicago, uh, having, you know, all sorts of vaccines, family, Moderna, which we're about to finalize, which will have mRNA. I can think of Upsala in Vancouver. So making sure that in Canada would have the, the key I mean, some of the key uh, manufacturing capabilities to ensure the health and safety of people for generations to come. And, and, and this has been a, a moment, I would say, for our nation. I would say it's, it's a bit the same in other countries, uh, in, in Western Europe and even in the United States. So that's, that's kind of the first thing is, is trying to think about what we need to onshore. The second piece of that is smart purchasing. I, I think we need to be smarter in the way we source uh, to make sure that we would scale and, and create domestic champion. Um, uh, Vic was alluding at the beginning, I think was the N95 mask where there was a bit of back and forth with our friends down South. And uh, they realized that the critical components came from Canada. So, <laughs> so that we had to work together. Uh, it, it just, for me, another reminder how integrated we are. If you ask me, Abdullah, in, in the digital world, for me, it's gonna be the digital charter. Uh, that for me is the highway of the future, making sure that we are best in class in the world, uh, a bit like as Sonia has done, that when the world thinks about 
uh, if people think in the world about the best incubator, they think about you. I would like them to think as Canada, once we have the digital charter of the best place to start to grow and to scale a business when it comes to the digital world. Uh, this is about building trust. This is about making sure that AI serves the people, that we protect children online, that we have a robust set of rules that will uh, carry the day and make sure that Canada is recognized as a champion around the world. And Minister, maybe if I may, because yesterday your government tabled uh, the first budget since the last federal election. So I, I got to bring it up in some ways, but um, you know, the budget included obviously the establishment of the Canadian Innovation and, and Investment Agency to invest in innovation and research. How does that plug in? How does, can you share and tell us more about how the agency will actually operate and what it's gonna be designed to do in this respect? Well, I'm very excited. You know, it started from a thought with uh, some of you may know about DARPA in the United States. Th those are some of the agencies, of uh, not to go into too much detail because of time, but, but advanced research projects, you know, those are the type of agency, um, uh, ARPA and others that you've seen in the United States, which have been really thinking about where is, is technology going in 20, 30 years from now. Uh, DARPA was, was there where we, uh, the internet was invented, GPS. Um, and, and I think if you look at the big challenge of humanity, whether it's COVID-19 or climate change, it's clear that science, technology, and innovation will provide the breakthrough solution. So inspired by what has been done down south, we have decided to create our very own Canadian version of that, which would be fitting within the Canadian innovation research ecosystem. We already have uh, you know, research councils. We already have a lot of university, technical institute, polytechnics, colleges. So we decided to create our own version, understanding that the having an agency which is focused on supporting the type of innovation that will make you succeed over the next few decades is what's going to preserve our prosperity and, and, and productivity in this country. So uh, uh, more to say about that in, in the coming, me uh, coming weeks and months. But I think it's very exciting. I think that was a piece. You know, we talk about fundamental research, applied research. But this is really looking like 20, 30 years ahead. What is going to be the big things that we need to focus on? Wonderful, Minister. And speaking of research, Minister Fideli, if I may shift to you, if you don't mind, um, we know that obviously intellectual property serves as the foundation of uh, innovation in our economy. Um, and Minister Champagne spoke so eloquently about that just a, a few seconds ago. Um, innovators should always be recognized and, uh, and even awarded for their contributions towards STEM. Um, but IP has become the, uh, the, the global currency of innovation, I believe, after town. And just recently, the government of Ontario announced the launch of the new agency that is designed to help businesses commercialize their ideas and products. So uh, a question that I would have in this, in this respect, and again, linking it back to knowing that we're working with a lot with universities and DMZ, for example, is part of a university. How does the government plan to use IP to make Ontario more competitive, to really position ourselves in leveraging all this incredible IP that we've been able to create and commercializing it, getting it out there and kind of, again, putting our, our stake in the ground and saying, we are here and we are doing the best work. Minister. Well, thank, thanks, Abdullah. So a couple of things, the, uh, the uh, IPON, as we call uh, the Intellectual Property Ontario, is a new agency. We kind of are splitting it in two. Uh, the, the, the research side of, of R&D is being done, uh, is being administered through Ministry of Colleges and Universities. The D side, the development side, is with my ministry, MedCap, they call it, Ministry of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. And so we will have services available to help you protect your IP, learn how to patent, learn, we'll have lawyers available. So we've got a full suite of, uh, uh, of concierge services basically to offer companies. Another big part of our whole IP strategy, if you look at our contracts today, whether it's you know, through the regional development programs or Invest Ontario, the contracts that we had absolutely and solidly protect the Ontario IP that's developed. Uh, any removal of the IP from Ontario, you owe the money back. Plain and simple, it's, a, it's contractual. So that's a real change. What we passed just a couple of weeks ago in the, in the red tape reduction bill was something called Bobby. And the premier has been pushing us for this for two years. It's, it's a Building Ontario Business Initiative. Cute name, Bobby, but it's a big deal. 
what it means. So we set up Supply Ontario last year, and that's to centralize our purchasing. They buy $29 billion a year of supplies, quite, quite, quite a bit of it, obviously, for the Ministry of Health. Uh, but $29 billion comes through Supply Ontario by law now through legislation that has passed a couple of weeks ago through Bobby, they now <clears throat> must purchase, must purchase at least 3 billion made in Ontario. And part of this now is a series of challenges. And so I'll end by just telling you a little bit what I mean uh, by that. Uh, so instead of saying, well, here we are at Supply Ontario, we're buying 10,000 buggy whips today, uh, because we've always bought 10,000 buggy whips in, in uh, April. Now the challenge that will go out to businesses and academia is, here's our problem. We want to make our horses go faster. Please supply this challenge with your solutions. So instead of just flat out buying the buggy whips, we're looking for your solutions. And then we're obliged to purchase 3 billion of those solutions annually. That's wonderful. Uh, no, look, thank you. Sorry, go ahead, Mario. No, no, I was going to jump in. I wanted. There's one question I want to uh, sneak in before we run out of time. Thanks, Abdullah. The the uh, comes from the audience, and I apologize. Uh, some of the questions have already been answered. That's what happens. It's an occupational hazard. Uh, but this question from Travis Suthan: Why is it important to to, uh, to Minister uh, Champagne? Why is it important that the new Federal Innovation and Investment Agency be operationally independent and the Canada Growth Fund operate at arm's length? from the federal government? Should the Strategic Innovation Fund continue to be funded and operated separately from these two initiatives? Which model better facilitates coordination with the provinces? Uh, Mr. Champagne, unless Mr. Fideli, you want to rescue him uh, on this one, but no, go ahead. Well, listen, we, we work together. Uh, we're on the same ship, so there's no rescue needed. Um, uh, but I, I would say they're complementary, uh, Martin, and, and to uh, the person who asked. I mean, the Strategic Innovation Fund or the Net Zero Accelerator, which are the two funds, the kind of 8 billion we have federally uh, to support, we've seen that money in action. Uh, you know, we're going to be one of the first countries in the world to do green steel, green aluminum, uh, green batteries. Uh, we've been able to relaunch the auto sector and, and I would say put it in, in a position of success for generations to come. Uh, we've done that with biomanufacturing, aerospace. So that, that instrument was was needed and is a good instrument. Now, when you look at the innovation agency, uh, looking at what's been done in the UK, looking at what's been done in the United States, looking what has been done in Taiwan, in Korea, I think that uh, the level of independence is allowing us to attract the type of talent we want to run these organizations. You know, you just don't want that to be an extension of the ministry that I'm heading today. You want to have this level of independence where you can, and if you look in the United States, pretty interesting, Martin, people go to, to DARPA and they come out. It, it, you don't make a career. You, you go there, you are successful in what you do. You say, okay, I raise my hand, I'm going to serve for a couple of years, and then I'm back in the private sector. So uh, short tenure, uh, flexibility in the granting, flexibility in what you're going to put your bet on. Obviously, we we have to make that with the Canadian flavor, uh, because the bench they have in the United States to absorb uh, the type of innovation that they generate is is much bigger. So what we're doing there with this agency is to making sure uh, with with universities with with the ecosystem we have that they fit well with that. But I think the the independence level uh, is going to be complementary and is needed sometime to make sure that you attract the right type of people. Uh, to to make these big bet on our future, I would, okay, I would we're, we're, go ahead. Yes, I, I would add to Travis uh, that when we set up uh, Invest Ontario, which is uh, the provincial investment agency, we looked right across Canada at other models. We looked a lot in the states at their models. We looked around the world as well, and we ended up setting ours up much like uh, Francois said independently so it's just not an extension of my ministry uh, wh wh why would I do an agency that just has another department this is independent it's got their own CEO their own staff their own board um, so it was designed to take over 
those investment decisions. And, and I will slowly reduce my staff now so that we're, we're still kind of evenly balanced uh, as I, as I so from a cost perspective. We're, we're not adding cost to the taxpayer. Uh, we've shifted over. Uh, I think it's, uh, they made their first investment. They're about to make their second. Uh, I, I like the fact that they're independent and they bring, you know, this is a really uh, 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 blue chip board that brings world-class attention to detail. Elise, um, uh, the, the chair, former uh, uh, boss at GE, she's doing a spectacular job, uh, really paying attention to the detail. And, and we're going to see some great successes from there. Okay, we're almost out of time because we have a hard stop in a couple of minutes and you both have to get back to saving the world, boosting productivity and prosperity, getting reelected, selling the budget, et cetera. I do have, I wanna ask you both very quickly so we don't go into overtime to just you know you, zoom out again to our theme at the outset, which is to complete, to close the circle. So you're out there spending money and, and investing money, um, sharing in, in, in or, or taking credit where you can. How do you share in the credit? How do you avoid uh, stepping on each other's toes and have, or have you wrong footed each other and had to sort it out with that magic texting of yours? Well, if you ask me first, I would say I, I'm, I'm happy that you corrected yourself about <laughs> spending and investing. I, I've been trying to make that distinction for a long time. When you do what we do and you have a payback of a few years or you generate okay. 2,600 jobs, in my language, and I know Eng English is a second language for me, but that's investing. <laughs> that's not spending. Um, but, but, but to your point, uh, Martin, I would say, you know what? And to all the students, if you don't care too much about who gets the credit for what and you do the right things, things will go well. I think that historically, when people are so focused about who takes credit for what, you know what, we're in this together. Those who benefit, um, and you'll see in our announcement, I never say I am pleased, I'm honored, I, I feel good. No, no, it's not about me or Vic. It's about the workers, it's about the families, it's about the companies, it's about the communities we are in. When you see what we did in Alliston, the mayor said, it's even difficult to fend on the impact of having an investment like Honda did. It's even difficult to impact uh, to, to phantom what's going to happen in Oshawa with, with the rebirth almost of Oshawa. So my message to the students who are with us, you know, if, if you don't focus much on who gets credit, but you focus on doing what's right, you'll do very well in life, in politics, in business generally, because too much in, in the past people have focused on who gets what. People are the winner when we work together. Yeah, Quick last word to you, Vic. Yeah, I think uh, uh, I think a lot about uh, the five billion dollar investment in Windsor and what that means and how transformative that means. It's a five billion dollars worth of building. It's it's a four and a half million square foot building is being built, the size of 112 hockey arenas. To put it in perspective, think of the thousands and thousands of men and women who are going to go to work there almost immediately for two years building that. And when that shining building opens, 2,500 people will go to work there for the very first time. They have hope now. They have a path ahead for them. And then you look in Oshawa, General Motors. You know, when, when we took office, the, the, the auto sector was just crumbling. It was, it was really uh, 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 leaving Ontario. Then this announcement that was made some time ago, they had the fastest um, construction of a brand new facility from announcement to building was 12 months. 1,800 men and women went to work there building the heavy duty Chevy Silverado. 1,800 new jobs. We were there last week and they announced a third shift to build a light duty Silverado. 2,600 people are working where no, there was zero in that plant 12 months ago. You go, to you go to bed, you put your head in your pillow, and you just you, you think about those families going to work. And boy, that yeah. that just it just it just makes your it just makes your this swell with pride. And and, and who who cares about that about you know who who did this or who said that? It's really about those people. And they have hope. They have dreams now that can be fulfilled all because of the work that our, all of these teams have done together. Okay, thank you. And, and as I tell my kids, um, uh, sharing is caring. So thank you for sharing the credit and for sharing, sharing your time. 
I, I, a, a progressive conservative, forgive me, uh, Francois Philippe, but progressive conservative cabinet minister once said to me years ago, before you were both born, that uh, good government is good politics. So, so maybe that's the moral of the story here. I would like to thank uh, both of our minister guests for, for coming together. It's taken us a while to schedule this. COVID almost got in the way. So thank you for your for, for, for coming together today for us. I wanna thank also, so thank you, Minister Champagne, Minister Fideli, a special thank you to uh, Abdullah for letting his expertise and asking all the tough questions while I was the good cop today. Um, uh, thanks for joining us, stay safe, uh, safe travels. Uh, a special thanks quickly to the, to the Dean of Arts, Pam Sugiman for sponsoring today's event and also the manager of media strategy, Rianne and John for helping to organize it. And thanks to everyone who joined us uh, today. I'll be writing more about this next week in my own column in the mighty Toronto Star. So stay tuned and stay connected to the democratic process. And bye for now. Thank you, everyone. Merci. Bon weekend.